All right. Good afternoon, everybody. Again, this is Paul Usowitz with the Bankruptcy Counseling Director at Community Credit Counselors. I want to welcome you to our uh, webinar, our monthly webinar. Today we're going to be doing part two of Check It Out. We did part one last month, and so we're going to be doing part two today and mainly focus on electronic banking. And we're certainly glad you could join us today. Uh, this afternoon to take time out of your day and join us uh, for this uh, important topic. All right, well, we're going to go ahead and get started. I thought what we would do is start with a recap of what we learned, if you were able to join us on the first webinar, uh, part one of Check It Out. And basically, we talked about the benefits of having a checking account instead of using a check cashing service and how it can save you, of course, money. Second, we talked about the different types of checking accounts available, and you want to find the one that's right for you. Third, we talked about how to open a checking account, the steps involved, what you would need. We then talked about how to write checks, and we went through a couple samples of, you know, writing out a check, what information you need, and how you typically write a check. Next, we talked about how to use ATM and debit cards. We talked about how to make deposits and withdrawals. And lastly, we talked about how to keep accurate records. All right, so that was a brief review of Chapter 1. Now, uh, Chapter Part 2. Uh, basically what we're going to learn today is uh, we're going to be able to, our objectives of part two as seen here, number one, where you're going to be able, after completing this part of the module, you'll be able to list four types of electronic banking services. Second, you'll be able to explain how debit cards are linked to checking accounts. Third, we're going to talk about how to record fees and transactions in your check register. We're going to also then talk about um, explaining overdraft fees and how they affect your checking account. We're going to reconcile a check register with a bank statement. And lastly, we're going to describe, of course, how to manage a checking account wisely. All right, now most of you probably already have a checking account and, and, and are familiar with writing checks, using an ATM card, and the basics of using your account, including making deposits and withdrawals. Uh, in this section, again, you will learn other ways to manage your money to make it more efficient and faster for you. All right. Now, electronic banking uses computers to move money to and from your bank account instead of checks and other paper transactions. And again, as you see, some examples of electronic banking include automatic teller machine or ATM transactions with the use of an ATM or debit card, uh, automatic bill pay, online bill pay, which is becoming very popular. And with the cell phones now and everything that they can do, cell phone banking. Now, most banks provide electronic banking services in which you can access your bank account from a computer or, again, even your cell phone. Many provide these services for free, while others may charge a fee. When you open your checking account, you obviously want to ask your bank what electronic or online services it does provide. All right, common services include electronic or online statements and alerts. Uh, money transfers, deposits, and withdrawals, bill payment services, debit card replacement and check ordering, account maintenance and information, and customer service uh, via email or online chat you can even do sometimes. Now, Internet commerce is fast and convenient, but as with the old-fashioned way of doing business, it pays to take the precautions discussed throughout this module. Okay. We're going to start our discussion with debit cards, very popular, of course, in the last several years. Now, a debit card is similar to an ATM card in that both allow you to deposit cash into and withdraw money from your checking account at ATMs. The difference is that you can use a debit card to make purchases at retail locations as well, like department stores, gas stations, things like that. Debit cards generally feature a Visa or MasterCard logo, so you can make debit or credit purchases where these cards are accepted. When you make a debit purchase, normally you have to enter your personal identification number, your PIN number that you make up or that's assigned to you, whereas with a credit purchase, you may only have to sign the merchant receipt. All right, a, a, a note about PINs. Uh, PINs or personal identification number are secret code, usually four digits. Obviously, you should never tell anyone your PIN or write it down where you keep your ATM debit or credit card. 
Also make sure no one is trying to watch what numbers you input. I always typically put my hand, cut my hand over the keypad as I'm entering in my PIN number. Your PIN would be valuable, obviously, if a thief were to steal your card, because they would have access to everything then. Now, if someone does use your card without your permission, federal law does protect you, but the protection differs depending on wh whether you use your debit or your credit card. With the debit card, the disputed transaction will have already been withdrawn from your account. If you report the problem promptly, however, the financial institution will put the money back into your account, typically less $50, if it is unable to resolve the matter within 10 business days. You must report errors within two business days of discovering them to be fully protected under the federal law. So it's important you report it very promptly. Now some banks may voluntarily waive all of your liability for unauthorized transactions if you took reasonable care to avoid fraud or theft. With a credit card now, you do not have to pay the disputed transaction while the company that issued the credit card is investigating the matter. If someone uses your credit card without your permission after it's lost or stolen, federal law limits your losses to a maximum of $50, although industry practices may further limit your losses. Okay, we're staying on debit cards. Let's talk about temporary holds for a minute. When you swipe a card for a purchase where the exact amount is not known, some examples of these would be when you go to a hotel or when you're reserving a rental car, a temporary hold is sometimes placed on funds in your account until the actual transaction posts to the account. Now the hold will likely be for an amount greater than you actually spent. This temporary hold, keep in mind, could prevent you from buying other things even if you do have the money available. For example, imagine you have $200 in your checking account and you use your debit card to reserve a hotel room that costs $100. If the hotel places a temporary hold on the funds in your account for the amount of $200, you will have no money available to use until the hotel posts the charges to your account or releases the hold. Now many car rental companies and hotels allow you to use debit cards to reserve a car or room. As we said, the temporary hold amount is generally more than the cost of the car or the room and it can last several days. So when making travel reservations, be sure to ask about the debit card hold policy. Okay. Continuing on this kind of theme for a couple minutes on debit versus credit cards. Whenever you use your debit card, always ensure there's enough money, as we've said, in your account to avoid being overdrawn. Unlike credit cards, which will allow you to make purchases now and pay for them later, debit cards deduct the amount from your checking account as soon as you make the purchase, of course. If you have insufficient funds or not enough funds in your account to cover the transaction, you can incur costly overdraft fees. Nobody wants those. Here are some other brief differences between a debit, card and a debit card and a credit card. A debit card, again, payments, buy now, pay now. It comes out immediately. Whereas a credit card, buy now, you get your statement, you pay later. Interest charges. With a debit card, no charges apply as funds are automatically debited from your checking account. Credit card, of course, charges will apply if you carry a balance or if your card offers no grace period. All right, fees. Fees on certain transactions with a debit card, uh, an example of an ATM fee charge for withdrawing funds um, from an ATM not operated by the financial institution that issued your card. You could be charged that fee. And potentially costly fees if you try to spend more money than you have in your account, those overdraft fees. With credit cards, you have fees and penalties if payments are not timely. Some cards also have annual fees, as we've talked about in the past. And not all cards offer grace period. Okay, some other potential benefits. Debit card, easier and faster than writing a check. You have no risk of losing cash that you cannot replace. Some three, some cards may offer freebies or rebates with the debit card. And four, as long as you do not overdraw your account, debit cards are a good way to pay for purchases without borrowing money or paying interest. All right, credit cards, some other potential benefits just to wrap up. Uh, freebies are sometimes offered as well, cash rebates, bonus points, travel deals. Uh, two, you can withhold payment on charges you dispute. And purchase protections offered by some cards for faulty goods. Sometimes you can get that type of protection with your card. All right, so that's just some credit versus debit card situations. All right, so we talked about debit cards. 
The next thing we're going to talk about for a couple minutes is automatic and online bill payment. And let's first talk about automatic bill payment. What did that do? Automatic bill payment transfers money electronically from your account to pay your bills automatically on the designated payment dates. Be sure to check with your financial institution because, again, the service may not be free with all accounts. You might have to pay a service fee every month. If you use automatic bill pay, you do not have to pay for postage. You don't have to worry about late payments. However, make sure, number one, if you use it, that you have enough money in your account to cover your bills when they're due and keep track of your account balance. Very important. A bill may be higher than anticipated. Uh, example, in the summer or winter when your utility may be bill may be higher, and you could also risk overdrawing your account if you don't have enough money to cover the bill or the transactions made after the bill is processed. Okay, so that's automatic bill payment. The next one is online bill payment. Now, online bill payment is different from automatic bill payment in that you can designate when bills are paid from your account each month. There are several ways you can pay the bills online. You may be able to pay bills from your online banking account through a budgeting software program or by creating an online account with your service provider, like your electric bill, your water bill. You create an online account. If you pay bills online, you may need to do the following. One, enter the payee's name, your account number, and other information related to the bill or company being paid. Two, enter your form of payment, basically your bank account information and or the payment amount. You may be entered to have to do that online. And three, click the payment option, either pay or send payment and or authorize the payment, of course. So that's online bill pay and automatic bill pay. All right, moving on, cell phone, mobile banking. Of course, everybody has cell phones these days, and um, uh, mostly everybody at least. And uh, depending upon the services offered by your financial institution and your cell phone service provider, you may be able to conduct the following banking transactions from your cell phone. One, you can receive text message alerts when your account balance reaches a certain level or when a certain transaction occurs. Again, check with your cell phone service provider regarding fees for sending and receiving text messages if they're not covered on your plan. Very important. You don't want to get a bunch of alerts and realize you're being charged for each one of these, and then your cell phone bill goes through the roof. Second, uh, you might be able to access your online bank accounts to check your balances, pay bills, and transfer funds uh, between accounts. Third, if your cell phone can maybe help you to locate your bank's closest ATMs. If you're out of town and you're not quite sure if there's one in that area, you can use your cell phone and check where the closest ATM might be. And you also may be able to use your cell phone for, to pay for purchases. As with a regular landline telephone or home phone, let's say, you can also call your bank to conduct many transactions uh, like we talked about uh, as well. Okay. Safe electronic banking. We're going to talk about that for just a moment. The Internet offers convenient new ways to shop for financial services and conduct banking transactions any day, any time. And I'm a little bit ahead of myself with the slide, so don't pay attention to that slide. We're getting to that next. However, safe electronic banking involves making wise choices that will help you avoid costly surprises, scams, or identity theft. Now, some precautions you can take include, number one, using a secure and encrypted connection to the Internet. Two, excuse me, I'm sorry, disregarding fraudulent emails, asking you to send your account number, password, or any personal information via email. Legitimate financial institutions do not ask for this information via email. I just got something in my inbox um, regarding one of my credit card accounts in regards to this and saying, you know, we, we need to confirm your information. Uh-uh, not going to do it online. You know, it gave a spot to enter it in. Not going to happen. All right, three. Confirming another safe, uh, principle of safe electronic banking, confirming that an online bank is legitimate. You can go to www.fdic.gov and check it out and make sure that bank is legit. Four, monitor your bank account activity closely. Five, keeping your information private. Six, contacting your bank to find out more precautions you can take with the online and mobile banking services that they offer. 
And last, using antivirus software, keeping it updated to detect and block spyware and other malicious attacks, and using a firewall to stop hackers from accessing your computer. All right, so that's just some tips on safe electronic, you know, keeping your electronic banking safe. All right, now we have the screen in front of us. Steps for keeping accurate account records. We're going to talk about this for a couple minutes. All right, keeping an accurate record of your checking account activity obviously is very important. You want to keep accurate records so you know where you're at. It helps you know at all times the exact amount of money you have in your checking account. To keep an accurate record of your checking account, you should, number one, record all transactions in your check register or budgeting software if you have it. Two, record maintenance fees, interest, and other bank charges. You don't want to forget those. Three, review your monthly checking account statements, even if they come online. And four, reconcile your check register with the monthly checking account statements. Very important. All right. ATM, we're going to talk about receipts now in general. You should get a receipt whenever you use a debit card to buy goods or perform electronic banking transactions. If the merchant cannot give you a receipt or if you forget to get a receipt, promptly record the amount so you can record and track the expense later. Remember that all purchases, even the small ones, add up. You can avoid costly overdraft fees by recording transactions and monitoring your current account balance regularly. Now, when using an ATM, make it a practice to always get a receipt. You know, it always gives you the option. Do you want a receipt? It, yes. Printed ATM receipts usually include, as it says on the screen, gives you an example, the amount of the transaction, any extra fees charged, if that bank charges you a, a fee, the date of the transaction, of course, the type of transaction, a deposit, a withdrawal. This one on an example, it says withdrawal from checking a code for your account or ATM card and the available balance, the ATM location or ID code of the terminal used, and the name of the bank or merchant where you made the transaction as well. So those are all typically on the ATM receipt. All right. And we just went through. There we go. Okay. Next, we're going to take just a couple of minutes and talk about recording all transactions in your check register. If you do not regularly monitor your banking transactions and account balance online, you should record all transactions, you know, whether it be electronic banking, cash transactions, or writing a check. Record them all in your check register or enter them into a budgeting software program like QuickBooks or something like that. If you have a joint account or if other family members have an ATM or debit card, that is attached to your checking account, then make sure you also record their transactions. Again, you want to record everything, bottom line. A check register helps you keep track of the money you put into and take out of your checking account. A sample check register you can see right there in front of you. And you know you can follow along while we review each column. Number one is the check number. You always want to record the check number of any checks you use. Uh, I also, if for some reason I have to void out a check, I still write it. I put the check number and under the description, as we'll get to in a minute, I put void. So I know that check was voided, and I can account for every single check. Second, the date. Uh, obviously, record the date of each transaction, whether it be a withdrawal, a deposit, interest you receive, or a fee charged by your bank. Third, a description of the transaction. You know, the name of the company or person you wrote the check to. If it was an ATM deposit or ATM withdrawal, uh, you know, anything like that. Uh, four. The payment or debit. Record the dollar amount of any payments, debits, or withdrawals. Or if it's a depositor credit, on that column put it in the depositor credit. Made, you know, any deposits or credits made to your account. And last, add any deposits or credits or subtract any payments or debits to get the new balance after each transaction. All right. And here we go, just as an example, uh, to understand how you use it. We're going to complete a check register. As you see, it's done online. Here's the scenario. You have a previous balance of $200 on February 20th. On February 26th, you write a check to Coffee Mart for a coffee maker for $19.75. So you put the date, the check number, 105, the payment, 1975. Your new balance is $180.25. 
On March 12th, you withdraw $100 from an ATM. So again, you put withdraw $100, and now the balance is 8025. You subtract out the 100. On March 19th, you receive a $50 prize from your job for having the best attendance. Way to go. Also, you receive $30 from a rebate you earned when you bought two new tires from your car. And you deposit both into your checking account. So now, obviously, you record those, and now your new balance as of 319 is $160.25. Okay. So, and that's just an example of, again, completing it. Most of us have done that, and it's pretty basic, but, again, just thought we would review it. Okay. You also want to record interest and fees. With an interest-bearing checking account, you want to review your monthly account statement to determine how much interest you receive. Record this interest, as obviously, as a deposit in your check register or budgeting software. Your monthly account statement will also indicate if you're charged for any fees. You would record any fees as a payment or debit. And again, using your practice check register, you record a $5 monthly maintenance fee that was withdrawn from your account on March 20th. And there you see that's done. It now brings it down to one fifty-five twenty-five. All right. And you put the date, the description, the amount under payment or debit, and then you subtract it and the new balance. Okay. Now that we've recorded all of our transactions, it's time to review our monthly account statement as we start to wrap up here. All right. Each month, you will receive a checking account statement from your bank. Now, the statement will list transactions that occurred during the preceding month. These transactions may include cash checks might include withdrawals or deposits, might include debit card purchases, and finally, any interest earned or fees charged. Now, checking account statements vary from bank to bank. If you have any questions, ask your bank customer service representative. That's why they're there. Now, we'll look at a sample checking account statement. Most checking account statements show, number one, of course, at the top, your bank's name and address somewhere, two, the time period covered by the statement, okay, you can see for period ending 320, let's say 2012, all right, it'll give you the time period. Number three, it'll have your name and address, of course. And then it'll, it'll have your account number. It'll have a list of transactions by date. Six, it'll a list of all cash checks in numerical order normally by check number. However, some banks do not provide this. Keep that in mind. And then lastly, it'll have a statement summary, including any fees and charges, if any. Okay, so you see the example there. It's got, you know, your previous balance 200, the check, ATM withdrawal, monthly fee, ending balance 7525. Clear checks, and it'll show the number 105 was the only check that was written during that month. Previous balance, total deposits, total withdrawals, number of checks, number of ATM transactions, the service charge. <coughs> Excuse me, ending balance 7525. Okay, and there we go, everything I just covered. All right, reconciling your checking account. Balancing your checkbook means keeping your checkbook register up to date by recording all transactions and maintaining totals so you always know, again, how much money is in your account. Give me just one moment. Okay. When you get your monthly checking account statement, you may notice a difference between the statement balance and what's in your check register. Now, why does this difference occur? It may occur because you did not record some of the transactions listed on your bank statement. Or maybe some of your recorded transactions were posted after the bank statement was prepared and sent to you. So again, that's balancing your checkbook. Now we're going to talk about reconciling your checkbook. And that helps you to find the reasons for the differences and make any necessary corrections. Now, we will review the two steps or two different ways of reconciling your account here. All right. And you can see we kind of have those noted there. Um, and uh, basically, we're going to use a checking account reconciliation form to reconcile your check register with your monthly account statement. If your bank includes a checking account reconciliation form and instructions on the back of the monthly statement, 
most banks do, you can use this to reconcile your account. Step one, obviously, compare your check register with the monthly statement. Put a small check mark beside each item in your check register that matches an item on your statement. Step two, are there any deposits listed in your check register that are not recorded on your account statement? If so, list and then total these deposits. All right, and you can see the $30 and the $50 deposits are missing from the account statement. This is likely because they were not processed prior to the printing of this statement. Step three, are there any withdrawals listed in your check register that are not recorded on your account statement? If so, again, list and total these withdrawals or debits. Answer in this scenario, no, there are none. No. If there are outstanding deposits and withdrawals missing from your check register, you would add them to your check register like we did in the previous activity. All right, now complete the reconciliation form. Enter the account balance listed on the monthly checking account statement, 7525. Okay. Add the total of deposits outstanding from step two, $80. Calculate the total. Obviously, that now with 75.25 plus 80, 155.25. Subtract the total of withdrawals outstanding from step three. Step three, we didn't have any, and so calculate the final total or balance, 155.25. Does this equal the balance in your check register? Answer should be yes. All right. We're going to talk then, lastly, about correcting errors on your statement. If you see an error on your statement, you want to call, write, or visit your bank as soon as you find the error on your bank statement. If you call or visit your bank, it's a good idea to follow up by writing a letter. Keep a copy of the letter for your records. The letter should include your name, your account number, an explanation and dollar amount of the error, the date the error occurred, and finally, any conversations with bank personnel regarding this error. The bank and take names, too. The bank must receive error notice of the error no later than 60 days after the date of the statement. So you have two months. They have to receive it within that 60-day period. What questions do you have about correcting errors on your account, if any? Um, we've discussed the importance of monitoring transactions and reconciling your check register with your account statement so that you can avoid costly overdraft fees. We will talk more about those overdraft fees now. All right, an overdraft occurs when you don't have enough money in your account to cover a transaction, or in other words, you try to withdraw more money than your checking account than you actually have available to spend. I've been there. Assume you have $10 in your account. The phone company electronically debits your $50 bill uh, from your checking account, as you ask them to do every month. If you have an overdraft program linked to your account, your bank would pay the bill, and charge you an overdraft fee, perhaps around $35. If you do not have an overdraft program set up linked to your account and you overdraw your account, the bank would normally decline the payment or return a check where applicable to the phone company. The bank and the phone company may then charge you a non-sufficient funds fee, NSF fee, or returned item fee, which could normally range anywhere from $15 to $50 apiece. Either way, your balance would fall below zero and you would overdraw your account. This can happen easily if you don't reconcile your account or pay attention to what you spend. So if this happens to you, obviously you need to make a deposit in your account to replace the amount you withdrew, plus cover fees to bring your balance positive again. Do so, obviously, as quickly as you can, as the bank might charge you interest or additional fees the longer your account balance remains negative. All right. We're going to talk about the opt-in rule for some ATM and debit card transactions. The bank will ask you how to handle certain overdrafts generated by number one, ATM transactions, and or number two, one-time debit card transactions at store point of sales terminals, when you go over to a store and you buy something. If you opt in to the bank's overdraft program, the bank can charge you a fee, perhaps $30 or more, to process the point of sale or ATM transactions that exceed your account balance. Then overdrafts and the fee will be deducted immediately in full from your next deposit. These deductions will lower your account balance and may increase the risk of more overdrafts. So again, pretty much they'll pay it 
but you're going to be charged a fee, and then it'll be taken out of your next deposit. If you do not opt in, the bank will decline your ATM transactions and withdrawals and debit card transactions at POS terminals if you do not have enough money in your account to cover the withdrawal or purchase. You will not be charged fees, however, but it will be declined. Remember, the opt-in rule only applies to ATM and certain debit card transactions. So again, even if you do not opt in to overdraft coverage for certain ATM or POS transactions, as they're called at the store point of sale, the bank may still charge you overdraft fees for other types of transactions, such as for checks or for bills you automatically pay through your debit card each month. All right. And remember, there's a sample opt-in notice, you know, that you're seeing in front of you, and uh, you either click I do not want or I want to pay overdraft fees, and yeah, that's a sample opt-in notice. All right. Let's talk about other types of overdrafts. Okay, again, as we said, it doesn't apply to other types like checks, automatic bill payment, things like that. All right, let's talk about bad checks, check overdrafts, bad checks and bounced checks. If you write a check without enough money in your account to cover the checks, it is also known as writing a bad check or bouncing a check. Now, stores likely will charge you a fee when you write them a check without having enough money in your account to cover it. The fee is usually posted near the cashier. As you saw earlier, your bank would also likely charge you an NSF fee. Now, the fees could be, again, $30 or more. Knowingly writing a bad check, all right, or doing so with fraudulent intent is a crime in every single state. Each state has different civil and criminal penalties, could include fines, jail time, so for this reason, if you ever do mistakenly write a bad check, you should correct it as soon as possible. If you repeatedly overdraw your account, your bank might close your account and report negative checking account activity to an account verification company like Check Systems or Telecheck. This could make it very difficult to cash or write checks and open bank accounts in the future. What should you do if a bank turns you away as a customer because of an unfavorable report about your bank account? Ask the bank for the name, address, and phone number of the company that furnished a report, and then request a free copy and look for and correct any incorrect or missing information. Very important. If your bank was the source of an error in your check report, the bank must contact the check reporting service and have um, the record corrected. If you dispute the matter in writing and the check reporting company does not change the record to your satisfaction, you are entitled to add a written statement to your report. So you can just add something and send in a written statement. If you have a concern involving a bank or a check reporting service, contact the appropriate federal regulator, of course, or in the case of check reporting services, the Federal Trade Commission, the FTC. All right, we're going to wrap up this uh, webinar today by talking about bank overdraft programs. All right, and you see we have a uh, uh, an overdraft scenario right here in front of us. Lisa had a checking account. She spent $150. She only had $125 in her account. She was charged a $30 overdraft fee. All right, and then we're going to talk about how much did Lisa actually overdraw from her account. All right, by the time her check is, you know, how much did she? Uh, answer is $55. If Lisa gets paid in three days, all right, because you have the $50, you have the $30 plus the $25 that she originally wrote the check for, so that's $55. All right. If she gets paid in three days and the bank charges her $5 a day for every day she's overdrawn, how much will she be overdrawn by the time her check is deposited? Another $15 or $70, okay? So there you go. When Lisa receives her paycheck for eight sixty-five, what will her new balance be? The answer: seven hundred and ninety-five dollars. Because her originally was eight sixty-five, but they have to subtract out the seventy. So hopefully, you will not overdraw your account. But if this occurs, remember that the amount you deposit will be reduced by the amount you have overdrawn, and be sure to account for that when you reconcile your checkbooks. Okay. By the way, all financial institutions must now disclose on their monthly bank statement 
the total dollar amount of all overdraft and NSF fees charged to your account. Your monthly statement must include separate total amounts of fees for the statement period and the calendar year to date. Let's, I'm going to kind of backtrack here a little bit and let's talk about bank overdraft programs. Overdrawing your account can be very expensive as we've already just seen in the example. The best way to avoid significant overdraft and NSF fees is to remember to keep good records and check how much money you have in your account before you make a withdrawal or a purchase. Still, it can be a good idea to take time to learn what options you have to handle the rare situation when you spend more than you have in your account. Some options, we've already kind of discussed those, so I'm going to be brief, may include linking your checking account to your savings account. So the overdrawn amount is taken from your savings account. Essentially, you're borrowing from yourself, and you do not have to pay interest or high overdraft fees, although you might have to pay a small funds transfer fee. Remember, if you use money from your savings account to pay everyday expenses, be sure to repay your savings account. Second, link your savings account to a line of credit is another option. You will pay interest on any balance you carry, and you may be charged an annual fee. The sooner you pay off the money you borrow, the less you will pay in interest. Still, this option may be less expensive than traditional fee-based overdraft options. And then last, enrolling in an overdraft program for which you either pay a monthly fee or a per-item charge, which could be $35 or more per item. Fees can add up very quickly. If you use these repeatedly, they can become a very expensive form of credit. And also, with many of these programs, the bank does not guarantee you that it will cover any or all overdrafts. All right. So how do we avoid overdraft fees? Good account management is the best way to protect your hard-earned money. The best way to avoid overdraft fees is to manage your account so you do not overdraw it. You can do this by, number one, keeping your track of how much money you have in your checking account by keeping your check register up to date, as it says in bullet point one. Two, paying special attention to track your electronic transactions. Okay. Three, remember to record automatic bill payments and checks that you write. Four, review your account statements each month and reconciling them with your check register. Next, seeing if you can get email or cell phone alerts from your bank when your balance is running low. And keeping extra funds in your account as a cushion is always a good idea if you can do that. Sometimes mistakes happen. If you do overdraw your account, again, deposit money into it as soon as possible to cover the overdraft amount, plus any fees and charges from your bank. Withdrawals. This will help you avoid more fees. Wisely means taking responsibility for your money. It's your and yours alone responsibility. Always be sure to get all of the information you need from the bank before opening an account. And do not hesitate to shop around for a better account even after you open your account. Two, record all your transactions in your check register, including the electronic ones, to keep good track of your money. And three, reconcile your account regularly so you always know what the balance is. So congratulations, we've completed part two of the Check It Out module. You learned about electronic banking, reconciling an account, overdraft and line of credit programs, debit cards on your checking account, and how to manage your checking account wisely. And to wrap up here, just remember using your checking account wisely can provide greater convenience, better money management, and safety. And it's less expensive than the check cashing services. All right, that's going to wrap up our webinar today. I thank you for attending our presentation of Check It Out. And we hope you'll join us next month for Money Smart, Money Matters, How to Keep Track of Your Money. Remember to join us on Facebook at www.facebook.com slash community credit counselors or follow us on Twitter at CCCI Tweets. Again, I thank you very much, and everybody enjoy your day and your week, and we'll talk to you next month. Thank you. Have a great day.